When someone is accused of a crime, they can either plead guilty to it or not guilty and go to trial. Most times it's pretty cut and dry. But what happens if the accused has a mental illness, one so severe that it blurs the line between guilty and not guilty? It is in that blurry area that a person can be deemed guilty of the crime, but found not criminally responsible. New Center Maine's Jackie Mundry is here with a deeper look at how some people who have committed serious crimes end up never going to prison. Jackie? Amanda Bryan, when it comes to Maine state law, a person can be found not criminally responsible by reason of insanity if the criminal act was a result of mental illness and the defendant lacks the capacity to understand the wrongfulness of the crime. In just the last few years, we've covered two homicide cases in which there was no question the defendant committed the crime, but was not found criminally responsible. One of the defendants was Quentin Hanna, who was not only charged with murder, but also sexual assault during what police called a two day crime spree. The woman he sexually assaulted sat down with me to talk about what happened and how she feels that this man was never sent to prison. It was a beautiful sunny day in December. Rebecca Porter will never forget December 15th, 2019. And I went to go set out for a run like I um, do quite often. As she was running, she heard a car that didn't sound right. The driver asked Porter to help look under the car, which she says she thought was strange. Before I could um, really um, respond to to that. Um, he pulled a knife on me. Court documents say the driver of that car was Quinton Hanna, and Hanna started ordering Porter around. Be quiet, um, not mo not move, not run, um, or that he would kill me. Porter says she tried to plead with him, but Hanna would not listen. Then he pushed her to the ground and held her down. You know, he had the knife in his hand, and so this knife blade is, is um, you know, right next to my throat, right next to my face. She quickly realized what was about to happen to her. In the woods, not far from the road, Quentin Hanna raped Rebecca Porter. After the assault, she says her will to live kicked in, and she somehow broke free, running away as fast as she could. But Hannah didn't stop there. He got in his car and chased her. She says as the car got closer to her, she jumped off the road and into the woods. The person didn't um, didn't stay on the road. He actually was driving off into the woods um, to try to run me over. Court documents reveal that this was not Quentin Hanna's first violent crime. The night before, he is charged of knocking on a door of a Freeport home and stabbing the man who answered. That man survived his injuries. The next man would not be so lucky. The very next morning, Hannah is accused of stabbing and killing James Pearson at his Scarborough home. Right after that is when Quentin Hannah spotted Rebecca Porter out for a run. Hannah was arrested and charged for these crimes, but instead of heading to trial, the court found him not criminally responsible on all counts. But what does that mean? Well, per state law, a person can be found not criminally responsible by reason of insanity if the criminal act was a result of mental illness and the defendant lacks the capacity to understand the wrongfulness of the crime. When a person is found not criminally responsible, they are sentenced to the care and custody of the commissioner of Maine DHHS. That means Riverview Psychiatric Center. And as of March of last year, there were 98 people who were in Riverview for NCR, more than 20% of them for murder. That's one in five. Tim Zarillo is a Portland-based defense attorney. Were you able to appreciate the wrongfulness of your conduct? And of course, we're not talking about, you know, something that is small. It's got to be something that is very big, a serious mental illness that, uh, that is impacting your ability to appreciate that what you're doing is actually wrong. He says there is a misconception about the insanity plea. The public believes that if somebody's found not criminally responsible at a trial, that means they walk out the door free. That is just not true. Before a person can be found not criminally responsible, they need to be evaluated by a forensic psychologist like Dr. Charles Robinson. It's typically very serious crimes where the uh, NCR is advanced. 
um, most often most often homicides. He says he has completed thousands of these psych evaluations and he always looks for the same three things, their personality, their biology, and their culture. I look at their family background to see if they're psychiatric illnesses or uh, very commonly there's alcoholism and depression which are gene linked very, very, very closely. He says that helps him determine if a person's behavior is genetic. Then he looks at hospital, therapy, police, and even school records. He says all of these help him find historical truths and make his diagnosis. And oftentimes the case doesn't even go to trial. I write my report, talk to the lawyers, they talk to each other, they talk to the judge, and there's an NCR finding. Robinson and Zerillo say defense attorneys don't often use the NCR defense because it could make things more challenging for the defendant. Folks who are already hurting to begin with and may or may not be able to appreciate the wrongfulness of their conduct can get sentenced more harshly, can get have harsher consequences uh, than somebody who is of the right mind. I asked Maine DHHS repeatedly for an interview to learn about the state's perspective on handling these types of cases, but the department declined each request. Quinton Hanna was found not criminally responsible because of his schizophrenia diagnosis, but Rebecca Porter says that doesn't change the fact that she was violently raped. She's not even sure a prison sentence would have helped. But I don't think even if this um you know, if this person was found guilty and was in prison the rest of their life, um, you know, this is something that every victim is going to hold with them for the rest of their lives. And, you know, I, I have not used the word closure on purpose very intentionally because, you know, I don't think that closure is um, an accurate description of or an accurate expectation for something like this. I also spoke with James Pearson's family. They say Hannah killing their father is something they live with and deal with every single day, and they're still frustrated with the NCR finding. As for NCR's sentence to Riverview, they're evaluated every six months to a year. Part of the process includes the patient possibly getting different permissions, like more time outside, visitation with family, or even unsupervised time. When they get to court, a doctor testifies and explains why this person is or is not ready for those privileges, but the final decision is up to a judge. When we come back, we'll hear from people who have mentally ill loved ones about the challenges they face to get that person the help they need. Before the break, we told you about the legal process for finding someone not criminally responsible, in some cases for horrific crimes. But how can we prevent these crimes from happening in the first place? Experts say it comes down to proper mental health treatment. So here in Maine, we have something that's called the Progressive Treatment Program, or PTP. This is court-ordered treatment for people with severe mental health challenges. Many of whom may not even recognize they're ill. New Center Maine's Jackie Mundry is back with us now. And Jackie, how does somebody get into this treatment? So there's only a few ways. Healthcare providers, law enforcement, or legal guardians of a patient are the only people who can apply for and get someone on this court-ordered program. But loved ones of some mental health patients say they didn't even know about PTP until it was too late, like the family of Justin Butterfield, who tells me that getting the treatment he that could have excuse me getting the treatment he needed could have made the difference between life and death. Yesha Preventure and Justin Butterfield had a normal relationship. What really drew me to him was how kind and how caring he was um, in that he was just this big teddy bear and this big child at heart. The couple has one child together along with Butterfield's child from a previous relationship. But at some point in their relationship, she says Butterfield started acting different. He wasn't sleeping and started having delusions, which Preventure figured was stress related until it got more intense. It had progressed to the point where he, I was then the delusion, like he was convinced that I um, was talking to people directly out to get him and to get the children. The couple eventually split, but that didn't stop Preventure from advocating for Butterfield to get the mental health treatment he needed. She says she pleaded with law enforcement for help, but no one directed her to the progressive treatment plan or PTP and she didn't even know about the plan until it was too late. She says the correct treatment could have saved Butterfield's brother, Gabriel Damore. Instead, Butterfield is charged of killing Damore on Thanksgiving Day in Poland. 
now looking back at how unsafe I felt at times and that I couldn't get help anywhere and and then the aftermath of it all it's like this huge not for Gabe sorry but a huge sign of relief for me to not have to worry about him or that every single day. Perventure isn't alone. My marriage of 26 years didn't survive. Um, we had to lock our bedroom doors because we were afraid of him. Jean Gore of Gardner spent 13 years being afraid of her son while also trying to do anything she could to keep him safe. Instead, he was in and out of hospitals and jails. She says his schizophrenia was untreated. Like an evil flower, schizophrenia emerged into his life when he was about 20. Joe Pickering of Bangor was in the same situation, but his son Christopher died without getting the help he needed. We need to have help before tragedy. Um, and, 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 and Chris could have been helped. Not only did Gore and Pickering's sons have schizophrenia, they also had anisognosia, which means they weren't aware of their illness. If you don't believe you're sick, you're not going to want to take this poison that people are trying to shove down your throat. Gore was able to get her son the help he needs. Since then, she's been advocating for more people to be put on progressive treatment plans, along with Joe Pickering and former state senator John Nutting. All the stories are so similar. Nutting sponsored a bill in 2004, which created PTP in the state of Maine. He worked with Senator Ned Claxton last legislative session to better fund the program. The legislature wanted this to be ramped up, uh, but the department has been very slow in implementing it. When a court orders someone to a PTP, that person is assigned a team of mental health providers that they have to see. But advocates say... It's still just not being used the way it should. A department spokesperson says PTPs are designated to serve a specific population. It's for someone who has a severe mental illness, is likely to cause serious harm, and is unlikely to voluntarily follow a plan. Here's how Maine state law defines someone as a danger to themselves or others. They've threatened or attempted to harm themselves or someone else, or their behavior may cloud their ability to make an informed decision. The state says this is just one of, quote, an array of behavioral health services available in Maine. This kind of treatment does have opposition, though. We've lost the battle around PTP. It is in Maine state law. Simone Mallon is the executive director of the Consumer Council System of Maine. She says because the PTP is an involuntary hospitalization, therefore forced treatment, it's not as likely to work than if someone wanted to get the treatment themselves. Forced treatment for 99.9% .9 of people that experience it um, is traumatic. It could be the rest of their life. They lose certain liberties. Liberties like never being able to own a gun. She goes on to say that once someone is stabilized after being placed on a PTP, we should let them try to be healthy all on their own. How do we encourage them to get that care without forcing them into treatment and forcing them onto a PTP? I think it's all about building relationships, and that may sound hokey, but I truly... I actually left clinical work because it became more about getting paperwork done and billable hours. And, and I understand that stress, but for me that became intolerable. Preventure says she will never stop advocating for Butterfield. He was a wonderful dad and I knew that and, you know, I could have easily just stepped away and um, just washed my hands of it all. but. They deserve to have their dad in their life, and he deserves to have them, and he deserved to be well. Brian and Amanda, both of the groups opposing and in favor of PTPs are lobbying for bills in the legislature this session. We have more information on that on our website and mobile app. Certainly worth looking at that information because just incredibly eye-opening and so much involved in this. For sure. Wow, Jackie, thank you.